Hello, and welcome to Brightstream TV. I'm your host, William Everhart, and today's episode is all about Photoshop. Now, this is going to be a sprint course, so we're going to take you from start to finish on a couple of projects here. Now, if you're a new user to Photoshop, this is absolutely the course for you. So I'm going to give you a little familiarity with where to find things in Photoshop, kind of how we go about working inside of Photoshop, and then if we have some time, just some cool tips and tricks uh, that you can put to use right away inside of Photoshop. Now, if you're joining us live during the broadcast here, there's a chat pod to the right. Be sure to post your questions in there. And I see that we already have a couple of questions. And one uh, comes to us, uh, I believe, from Ellen, who asked, can we use these techniques inside of Photoshop Elements? Now, Photoshop Elements is kind of a smaller, more personal version of Photoshop. And yes, some of these techniques will be uh, usable inside of that particular application. But the vast majority of this is probably not going to be available. So please stick around, Ellen, and see if you can't pick up a few techniques. There might be a slightly different uh, uh, tool or uh, command that you would use, but you could get a similar result. All right, so great questions. Keep them coming, okay? And uh, so let's go ahead and get this thing kickstarted and let's see what it is that we're going to talk about today with Adobe Photoshop. All right, so today's topics, uh, we want to talk about uh, finding our way around inside of the Photoshop interface. So this is always uh, kind of a traumatic experience for anyone who's never experienced Adobe uh, before because they have a different way of doing things. So we're going to help you find your way around that interface and look for the things that you are uh, after. Next, I'm going to talk about the non-destructive method to image editing. There's so many folks out there that just they get started in Photoshop and they start hacking away at it. And what happens is we, we tend to run into issues, little stumbling, uh, stumbling blocks here. And so what I want to do is show you a non-destructive method for image editing. So when you hit one of those little stumbling blocks, it's easy for you to pick yourself back up and keep going. Next, we're going to talk about the image correction workflow. And this is another uh, really traumatic point for folks inside of Photoshop. It's like, well, I know where the tools are, I know what I want to do, but is there a particular order? Is there a certain way I should do it? So that's what we're going to talk about in that uh, correction workflow. And then, well, you, you know, once we get things fixed here in Photoshop, well, what do we do with it afterwards? How do we get this content from Photoshop out to other applications? So as you can see, we've got a, a pretty well-rounded course here. We're going to take you from start to finish, and I actually have a couple of different images in here that we're going to work with. Uh, we're going to do some compositing, we're going to do some image and color correction, we're going to do some fun stuff along the way. And um, so those files are available to you. Uh, if you're viewing us here uh, on the Brightstream page, there's going to be a link, a little button, uh, that will allow you to browse and download those exercise files. So if you want to follow along with me, go ahead and download those exercise files and, uh, and you can do so. You can follow right along with me. If you don't just want to sit back, uh, take some notes, that's fine too. And then of course, after this broadcast, um, we will make this video available for purchase right here on the Brightstream TV uh, website. Okay. Well, we've got a lot to cover here. Um, we're going to try to do this in about three hours. So we're going to take a, a break here in the middle so you're not having to sit uh, the whole time here, plus to give me a little chance to catch my breath. And then we're going to move on afterwards. Um, and be sure to stick around after the show. So if I, if I don't get to your question here, uh, during the show, we're going to try to do that. I'm going to try to keep an eye on that. But if I don't get to your question, we're going to have a post show. So I'm going to stick around for about an extra 15 to 20 minutes, uh, really just however long it takes, and get those questions answered for you. All right. So now that we know what we've got on tap, let's dive into Photoshop and let's take a look at that interface. All right. So uh, in Photoshop, one of the key things here is just to know where to find the, the tools or the commands that you need. Okay? And that's going to help you uh, uh, speed this process along. So we're going to dive into the Photoshop interface and have a look.
All right. Now I'm using the latest version of Photoshop. Now this is the Photoshop CC 2015 edition. And in fact, uh, it was just updated this week here, at least on this computer. So this is the latest and greatest uh, edition here. And the folks at Adobe have changed things up a little bit. They, they've changed the way that we uh, experience Photoshop when it comes to uh, opening files. So when you launch Photoshop, you're going to be presented with this screen here. And this is a welcome screen. And it used to be uh, a little bit different than this, but now they've kind of integrated it maybe a little more into the interface. And so what I have here is I have a list of recent files. These are some files that were recently worked on here on this particular machine. So that's really cool. I also have uh, options over here for different libraries. If you're a part of the Creative Cloud, you have an online library where you can keep keep various assets. And then you also have some presets that you can uh, build uh, new Photoshop documents. And then of course you have a couple of links here where you can create a new document or open an existing one. Uh, down here at the bottom, we have uh, just some branding and, and some marketing uh, efforts from Adobe. Uh, there's some Pretty neat stuff down here. There's a couple of uh, little tutorials down here, and this, this stuff kind of changes up from time to time. So, you know, feel free to check that out on your own. But for now, what we want to do is just take a look at this interface. And so what I want to do is go ahead, and I'm just going to create a new blank document here. So I'm just going to use one of the presets, okay? So I've chosen the preset here, and I'm going to choose this uh, print document because I'm not really concerned about the content itself. I just want to look at the interface. Now that I have a blank Photoshop document open, I want to take a look at you know, where the tools are and where the different panels are and just kind of get familiar with my environment. So like most applications, the Adobe products have, well, menu bars across the top. You click on a menu item, the menu reveals, and you will notice that some of these commands in here actually have some symbology out here to the right. These are your keyboard shortcuts, and there are a lot of them. So you will, uh, you will learn the keyboard shortcuts that are most relevant to you the more you use Photoshop. But it's really nice that they are there listed for you uh, at any time. All right. Now, right below the menu bar is this little bar here. It's a little horizontal bar, and this thing is contextual. It'll change. Now, this is what they call the tool options bar. So depending on what photographic tool I'm using, I'm going to get options for that tool listed right here. Now, speaking of the tools, those are listed down the left-hand side of my screen. Now, I've modified my interface here just a little bit. So yours may look a little different than mine. But my tools are in these two columns here, okay? And they gather the tools up. They try to organize them a little bit based on what they do. So I have some selection tools up here at the top. I have some editing tools here in the center. And I have some creation tools down here at the bottom. At the very bottom of this interface, I have a couple of color uh, cubes here. These are color swatches, if you will. And these are what we call a foreground color and a background color. And really the only thing you need to understand about the foreground and background color is that the foreground color is your active color. This is the color that if I'm going to paint something or I'm going to add something to this Photoshop file, it's going to be in that color. The background, well, it can be added to uh, the image, but typically if I'm going to delete something, it will fill it with this background color. That's not always the case. And that's one of the things that you're going to find here inside of Photoshop. And you're going to hear me say this a lot uh, during this course is that, well, it'll work in maybe one scenario, but not another. There's so many variables going on inside of Photoshop. And I think that's what makes it so difficult for new learners uh, to really accept Photoshop and really uh, dig into it and learn it. But um, patience and perseverance will, uh, will help you out a lot there. So uh, just kind of keep you cool and, and just keep plugging away at it. I tend to make things a little bit easy because I've been using this product since the very first version. And that goes back almost 30 years. Um, so I absolutely love it. And I enjoy trying to find 
all the little quirks and, and nuances of Photoshop and exploiting those. So I'm going to suggest that you do that as well. And this works with any application, not just Photoshop. Uh, learn what you can about it and then explore. Feel free to experiment. And that's really where the learning is going to take place. So I'm going to show you some cool stuff here, but I really want you to take it back and start working on your own. Work on some personal projects and explore it. All right, let's dive back in. So as I mentioned, the tools panel over here, uh, as I select different tools, let's say I want to work with, say, the move tool. So I come over here and I find that tool and I click on it. Now when I do, that tool option bar up here changes. So I have different options for different tools. So you're going to spend a lot of time up here in the tool options bar. All right. Now, down the right-hand side of my screen, I've got lots of levers and buttons and all kinds of cool stuff over here. These are what we call panels, okay? So with the panels, I can make adjustments to my image or maybe um, make adjustments to my tools. A really cool panel over here that I have open, and you may not have this one, and it's called the Clone Source Panel. This actually changes the behavior of the clone stamp tool. So it doesn't really do anything to the image per se. It just helps me uh, modify that tool a little bit more. Now another panel that's very similar to this can be found right up here in the window menu. In fact, all panels can be found underneath the window menu. Uh, this is the only menu that is actually alphabetized in the Adobe interface. So if I'm looking for something like the brush panel, all I have to do is pop open the window menu and look under the Bs. And sure enough, there's the brush panel. If I click on that, this is going to show me the uh, brush options. So if I select the brush tool, this panel lights up now and allows me to change or modify the behavior of that tool. So not all of these panels are for image manipulation. Some of them just help you modify and get a little more out of the tool that you're using. Now the panels, I have mine arranged in a couple of different configurations. So uh, I have some panels on the far right here, the color panel, the adjustments panel, the layers panel. These are already open. The panels are there. We can see the little levers and the buttons that are in there and they're active and they're ready to go. To the left of those panels, I have some little icons here. And these are the other panels. These have been uh, minimized. To use a panel that has been minimized, you simply click the icon, the panel flies out to the left or to the right, depending on where it is on your screen, and then you make the adjustment. When you're finished with the panel, you simply click the icon again, and the panel disappears. But the icon is still there so that you can access it at any time. Now you can also move panels around, and you can choose to open and close additional panels. Like I said, all of the panels are going to be found right here underneath the window menu. So if you're looking for a panel, you just don't see it in the interface, maybe it's not over there, try looking in the window menu. So let's say I want to do something like the paragraph styles. I find that, pop it open, and there we go. It opens a new icon for me with that panel loaded. Now these panels also have some other features. Not all panels have this, but some of the panels. And I'm going to take a look at the Layers panel. It's over here in the far right-hand corner of my screen. Down at the bottom of that panel, there are some icons. And some of them are available and some of them are not. But these icons are just shortcuts for um, just you know, more common tasks that you might perform within that panel. So in the case of a layers panel. I might add a mask to a layer. I might add some sort of adjustment to that layer. Uh, I might create a new layer or delete an existing layer. So it's really just little shortcuts here that make my life a little bit easier when I'm working inside of Photoshop. You can also access these features and more from the panel menu. So each panel has a menu. 
And so right here, I'm gonna go right back to the layers panel. And in the upper right hand corner of that panel, there's just four horizontal lines. Now, depending on your version of Photoshop, you may have the four horizontal lines and a little triangle pointing down. In either case, it is the panel menu. You click it and a menu pops open. So in this case, you can see that this is the layers panel menu. So I can do things like, well, I can create a new layer. I can create groups, I can lock layers, I can change blending up. So all kinds of cool stuff, but it's all related to whatever that panel is, uh, is about, in this case, layers. Now, if I wanna dismiss this, I just click out here away from the menu. So every panel has one of those. If I go to the adjustments panel, it has a menu, but it has different options. So these are, you know, obviously contextual to the panel that they come from. So hopefully that gives you a little better understanding, a little bit of a roadmap as to where things are within Adobe Photoshop. Now, you can customize the interface, and if you're new to Photoshop, I'm gonna have you refrain from customizing it too much, but I do wanna show you a couple of options for customizing this interface. The new version of Photoshop uh, has added an extra level of customization to the interface, and I think it's really cool, and it might actually be helpful for, uh, for new, new learners and then, of course, old pros like me. So let's check this out. Um, let's customize the tools panel for just a moment. So the tools panel over here has lots of tools in it. Now mine is in this two column configuration. At the very top, uh, there is two little tiny arrows here. And if I click on that, it will change it to a single column of tools, okay? Now, my personal preference is to leave it with the two columns. So I'm gonna just click that little arrow again, put it back. In addition to that, many of these tools actually have tools hidden underneath them. It's like, wow, we didn't have enough tools to deal with. There's a whole other set of hidden tools here. Well, how do we access those? Well, I'm just gonna go right here to my brush tool for a moment. And if I look here, uh, I can see that there is a little chip in the lower right-hand corner of that tool tile, as I like to call it. So there's a little, little arrow there. So if I click and hold on this tool in the toolbox, it will reveal a menu. And so underneath the brush tool, I have things like a pencil tool, a color replacement tool, and a mixer brush. So you say, well, my goodness, why did, why did they hide these tools? Well, they needed to simplify the interface a little bit because you just didn't have enough room for all the tools maybe in one panel without you know, just taking over your screen. So what Adobe tried to do is, is group these tools together. So similar tools are grouped together. They perform similar functions. Okay, so um, you'll wanna take a peek at some of these underneath here. Just click and hold on the tool to reveal the other tools underneath it. Okay, very cool. But you can modify this interface a little bit. There is a new tool in the latest edition of Adobe Photoshop, and it's right down here. It's just above my foreground and background color swatches, and it's this little ellipsis here. Okay, it's just like, wow, we didn't have enough tools. You went ahead and added another tool for us. Great. Well, actually it is, because what this tool allows you to do is actually customize this toolbar. You don't like looking for those tools, having to go and hunt for those hidden tools. This ellipsis tool here is gonna help you. What it is, is actually an edit toolbar. So I'm gonna click and hold on it and pop up this menu that says edit toolbar. So now I'm presented with two columns here. I've got a column on the left with all of my tools currently in the toolbar. And then over on the right, I have extra tools. So I don't have any extra tools because I have them all here inside the toolbar. But now notice how things like, well, like my move tool. It has another tool hidden underneath it. The rectangular marquee tool has actually three other tools hidden underneath it. So anytime you see something like this, uh, where there's groups of tools together, that means that these are hidden tools. Only one of these tools can be shown at any given time in your tool panel. So what I like to do is just take the tools that I really just don't use that often 
and slide them over here to the right in my Extra Tools section. So I'm going to grab something like the Artboard tool, brand new tool here for Photoshop. And it has its place, but maybe not for what I want to do. So I'm just going to slide it over here to the right. And I'm going to do that for a couple of other of these. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this, but I just want to pull a couple of those out. Come on down here, say the slice tool, or the slice select, great. Get rid of some of that stuff. So any of this, any of these tools that you don't think you're going to be using that often, maybe you want to slide those over here into the extra tools section. Now, what about the tools you do use a lot? Okay. So one of the things that we're going to be exploring in here is some of the healing tools. So I'm going to just slide down to that section. Now, normally these healing tools, and this the spot healing brush, healing brush, patch tool, content aware, and red eye tool. These are all really great for you know, editing your photos, you know, just cleaning things up a bit. But it's often a problem when you're having to switch between these tools because I have to go back over here to the tool panel, click and hold to reveal the menu, then select the item I want, then go to work. So what I want to do here is just separate these tools. And watch what happens here. So I'm going to grab the spot healing brush tool in this group, and I'm just going to drag it up ever so slightly. And it's going to separate it from the rest of them. Now, if you take a look over here in my toolbar, there is the spot healing brush right here where my cursor is. Right next door to it now is the healing brush. So it pulled it out from underneath the spot healing brush. Now, I'm going to continue that process. I'm going to do that for a few more of these. And I'm just going to separate those tools. So now all of my healing tools have their own space here inside of my Photoshop interface. Isn't that so cool? I don't have to go hunting for these tools anymore. Now, if there's other tools that you like to do that to, well, by all means, just go right through here and separate them apart. Other tools, like I said, that you're not going to use, just remove them. Slide them over here in the Extra Tools section. Very, very cool. Now, what happens when we do this, okay? What is this user experience? What happens to all these extra tools. Well, I'm going to click Done here. And so I've got my new modified toolbar here. But what happened to those extra tools that I added over there in that second column? Where did those extra tools go? Because they're not available to me over here in the Tools panel anymore. Well, they are. Remember the little ellipsis that we talked about that started this whole trend? Well, if we go back to that, then we'll find our hidden tools. So if I go right back down to this ellipsis and I click and hold, now instead of just Edit Toolbar, there are all of my extra tools. So you never lose a tool, you never misplace one, it's just put in a different location. And if I wanted to use one of the tools, I simply select it, and there we go. I'm using that particular tool. So, that should conclude our uh, ex exploration of the interface. We're going to learn a little bit more as we go along, so a little on-the-job training here as we go. But that should give you a good start as to where to find things and how to manipulate the environment. Now, like I said, there's more that you can do. You can move panels around, you can hide and close panels, and you can create your own workspace if you choose. But I'm going to ask you to hold off on that, especially for the new learners. Figure out where things are, what panels you do use a lot, which panels you don't, before you start hiding panels. All right. Well, let's dive into this and let's take a look at um, uh, actually using these tools and uh, getting to work on an image. All right. So before we actually start editing anything, I want to talk just a little bit about non-destructive editing. Um, most of the time when you're editing something in Photoshop, depending on what tool you're using or what command you're using, you could be um, permanently affecting the image. Okay? So we want to be careful of that. We want to make sure that we are um, trying to avoid that when we can. Now, sometimes you don't have a choice. It's like, I really got to get this done. I don't really have time to play around with it. I just need to make a few simple tweaks and, and get it on over into uh, maybe my e-learning project or my PowerPoint presentation. 
Okay? But when there is that time where you, you have the flexibility maybe to be a little more creative or you, know, you, you think that there is going to be a possibility that you're going to repurpose this content, you may want to think about non-destructive editing. Okay, so let's take a look at some non-destructive edits here. All right, so back over here in Photoshop, I'm just going to close this document. And I'm just going to open uh, another document here. So I'm going to open up one of my recent files here. Uh, I'm just going to open up the fill. Okay, so this is a shot here, and we're going to use this a little bit later on, but I want to show you a little bit about a, a destructive versus non-destructive edit. Okay, so this is my producer, Phil. Everyone say hi, Phil. Um, Phil was uh, gracious enough to be my guinea pig uh, for, for this lesson and many others, and so I want to say thanks to Phil for that. But what we want to do is we want to modify uh, Phil here a little bit. He looks a little, well, he looks a little green under the gills, if you'd say. And so we want to modify that a little bit. Now, I can do this in a destructive manner or a non-destructive manner. So let's talk about the destructive manner. First thing I'm going to do, because I'm going to do this destructively, is I'm going to save a copy of this file. So I'm going to come up here to the top under the File menu, and I'm going to choose Save As. And I'm just going to rename this. I'm going to call this Fill 2.0 here. All right. Next, I am going to make a change. So I need to make him less green here. I need to color balance this image a little bit. So if I go up to the Image menu, okay, there are some features in here that I can put to work. Now, there are some auto features here. So there's like an auto tone, auto contrast, auto color. And these just, you know, let Photoshop work its magic. Now, it's not always correct, but sometimes it works pretty well for us. So uh, I'm going to run this auto tone real quick. Okay, so it made a small change. Okay, now if I don't like the change that it made, well, I'm not too far along in the game. I can go to the edit menu and choose undo. Okay, so in some respects, that's not destructive because I can undo it. But let's say I go back and I apply that auto tone. Then maybe I do an auto contrast on it. And then maybe finally I do an auto color on it to balance it out. Okay, now I'm multiple steps deep. Well, Photoshop only allows for one undo. Now, there are some changes that you can make, but out of the box, you get one undo. So if I do this, the last step, which is undo auto color. And I'm accessing this from the edit menu. From the edit menu, the first thing should be the undo feature. Well, now that I have performed that undo, that same command is now redo. Okay, So it puts it back. But they also have this command here. If I go back to the edit menu, there is a step backward. And this will allow me to step backward a certain number of steps. So it does give you multiple undos, but it's just got a little different naming convention on it. Okay, So that will help, but that's still, the process here is destructive. If I save this file, okay, and this is my duplicate copy, this is my fill 2.0 here, so if I save this file, okay, those changes that I have made are permanent. I can never get back to the original. Okay, so that's what's meant by a destructive process. And I'll tell you this, pretty much anything under the image menu is going to be a destructive process. Now there's some additional adjustments here, and a lot of folks like to use these. They go to image and adjustments, and there's all these different adjustments that we can apply. All kinds of cool, great stuff here. Here's a little black and white filter, so I can go ahead and immediately convert this into a black and white image. I can adjust some of the values in here. Okay. Just kind of dial it in where I want, tell it okay. Once again, if I save this image, that's it. There's no getting the color back. Okay. So if I were to close this image and then I were to open it back up again, 
I cannot put color back in that image. That is a permanent change. Okay, so it's a destructive change. Other things might be that if you use some of your tools over here. So like, oh, let's say like the healing brushes. I'm gonna zoom in, let's say here on Phil. And let's say I just wanna remove the buttons here on his, uh, on his shirt, okay? Uh, a healing brush uh, or a spot healing brush might do the trick for me. Now what this tool does is I paint over an area and that area becomes dark. So I'm just gonna do this. See how it's turning dark there? And then when I release the mouse button, like magic, Phil lost a button there on his shirt. Okay? So I'm gonna do that again here, boom. Now, the way I went about doing that is that I applied that change directly to the image. So that is a permanent change. Once again, I save the file, close the file, and if I reopen the file, that's it. I can't bring those back. There is no undo for that, okay? There is no step backward for that. So those are destructive changes. And like I said, sometimes there's just little quick, little tweaks that you need to make to an image. And it's really just gonna go in a PowerPoint presentation or maybe you're gonna put something in an email blast or something like that. and and you're really not gonna revisit the image. And that's probably okay to make those little tweaks, those permanent changes. I will suggest that you make a duplicate copy of the image, just in case. But now what about this non-destructive editing that you're talking about, William? Well, let's take a look at the same process here, maybe doing a little color correction here and maybe removing those buttons, but in a non-destructive manner. So I'm gonna close this image and I'm gonna open that original fill image, the duplicate copy. Now, I want to make the color adjustment and then maybe I want to remove those buttons as well. Okay, so instead of using the image menu up here, I'm going to use the adjustments panel over here to the right. Now, my adjustment panel is just above my layers panel and that's just the way I have it configured. But in here, I can apply things like a color adjustment. All right, so let's take a look at a simple adjustment here. I am going to, oh, I'll use the color balance for this one. And, you know, there's, there's endless possibilities here. And that's, that's like I said, I, I mentioned that, and that's one of the things that there's so many different ways to achieve the same result. And that's a really hard part about Photoshop is learning all the different methods and, and which works best for you. I relate it to the game of golf. Um, when I go on the golf course, I don't take one club, I actually take a whole bag full of them uh, because there's different scenarios. So I need a different tool for each scenario. So same thing here in Photoshop. But in this case, I am going to adjust this. Maybe I want to remove some of the green in the image. So I'm gonna grab this green magenta slider. I'm gonna pull it a little to the left there. And then I'm also gonna do the same here with the blue. I'm gonna drag that a little to the left maybe, or maybe go a little right with it. Yeah, go a little right with it on that one. Looks pretty good. Okay, so if that's what I want, fine. I'm good to go. Now what about those buttons, okay? I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see those buttons, okay? So I've adjusted the color here on the image, okay? Now what if I decide, well, I really don't like that color adjustment. I'd like to take it back to where it was, okay? Well just so you can see that this uh, is truly non-destructive, I'm gonna save and close this file. I'm gonna save it, okay? It's gonna ask me for a new name because now this is gonna be a Photoshop document. It's gonna ask me if I would like to maximize the compatibility of this, so I'm gonna leave that turned on, tell it okay. So this image started life as a JPEG, and when I added that adjustment, it actually added a layer over here. So it's like an image within an image. And the JPEG format doesn't support layering. So when I save the file, Photoshop was smart enough to know this as well. That's not supported in a JPEG. Uh, it is supported, however, in a Photoshop file. So it went ahead and saved it as a true Photoshop file. Now, if I close this document, okay, you can see here in my recent files, I have the filled JPEG, which is the original, 
and I have my fill.psd. So I'm going to open that back up. Now this is the one I just made the color adjustment on, okay? But now let's say I decide, well, you know what? I, I really think I want to go back to that original kind of greenish look here. Well, right over here in my layers panel, that adjustment that I made, that color balance adjustment is right here. It is an extra layer. It's almost like a little filter laying on top of the original image. And if I poke this little eyeball symbol for that adjustment layer, you can see it's hiding or removing that adjustment. So now I'm right back to where I was. Pretty cool. Well, now this goes beyond just adjustments. What about removing those buttons on Phil's jacket or his shirt here? Let's, let's take a look. Now, if I wanted to remove those buttons, well, I have to target the background layer here. And I could use that same tool, the same little spot healing brush. But that's where the problem lies. I'm actually modifying this original layer down here. So what I want to do is I want to add an additional layer. Like I said, these layers are kind of like filters or, or little lenses above the original image. And they really allow for this non-destructive editing. So I'm going to add a new layer. I have the background layer targeted. This is the original image. I'm going to go down here to the bottom, and there is a new layer icon right there. Create a new layer. I can also do this from the Layers panel menu. New layer. And there's also a layer menu at the very top of the screen where I could create a new layer. Okay. In this case, I choose the menu option, so it allows me to rename this layer. So I'm going to say Remove Buttons. Okay, and I'll tell that OK. Now, the layer itself has nothing in it. It's completely transparent, and that is identified here in the Layers panel. See this little gray and white checkerboard here? Anytime you see that, that indicates transparency. It's invisible. So there's nothing on that layer. It's completely empty. I want to make sure that that layer is targeted, and I can tell that by these little brackets that are around the corner of that layer thumbnail. So if I click on the background layer, you see those little brackets jump around uh, the image of Phil. But if I click up here, there they are. All right, so now that that's in place, I go over here and I grab the tool that I want to edit with. In this case, it's going to be that spot healing brush. Across the top here, I can choose the different options for this brush. And there is an option up here that I have to activate. And it's this one right here. It's a little stack of layers. And it says samples clone data from composited data. Okay? So basically what it's saying is that it can clone this information from other layers, not just this one particular layer that I'm working on, which is empty. It's transparent. So I turn that on, and then I'm allowed to come in here, and I'm going to adjust the size of my brush. I can do that up here at the top as well in the Tool Options bar. I can click this little drop down, and this allows me to adjust the size and the hardness and the spacing of my brush. So I'm going to just slide the size down here a little bit. And when I mouse out over my screen, I can actually see this little circle here, and that represents the size of my brush. Now, there's also a keyboard shortcut for that, and that is the left bracket key. And every time I tap that, my brush gets a little smaller. And so I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller here, and I'm just going to paint over that one button, and I'll do that for this button as well. And like magic, they're gone. But let's say that, well, for whatever reason, we need to bring those back. Well, once again, I can just go over here, and I can turn off that layer, and there they are, just like magic. So a lot of the features that I'll show you today, I am going to use in this non-destructive manner. So I'm going to be applying these adjustments, say, in different layers. And that's going to give me the ability to, well, track back through it. So if I make a mistake, I hit a stumbling block, maybe I can back up a little bit, take back a few of those layers. And at any given time, I can save this document, I can close the document, and I can come back to it and still make those changes or undo 
the changes I made previously. And that's the whole concept about non-destructive editing. Now, is it for every workflow? Absolutely not. Now, I spent a good deal of my career working for magazines and packaging companies and marketing companies. And so for us, it was a big deal to have that flexibility to make changes on the fly. But not everybody is going to need that level of flexibility. So if you need it, great. And I encourage you to explore it and, and try it out for yourself. You might find that it is something that you absolutely need. All right. Well, let's dive back in here and let's take a look at some of the other options that we have here. What are some of the processes that we go through? You saw me just go through a couple of quick steps here on this image, but well, is there a, a particular order or a specific way you should be adjusting your images? Let's talk about that workflow. All right. So in lesson three here, I want to talk about this image correction workflow. As I said, this is usually a huge stumbling block for folks. It's like, well, I, I understand what the clone stamp does, William. I understand what the, the uh, levels adjustment does. I understand this, but in, in what order or is there a particular order in which I should be applying these different adjustments? And yes, there is. So let's talk about that. So, um, as I said, everything is subject to change, and you can modify this to fit your own unique needs. But a typical image correction workflow. It's going to start by checking the image for its size and resolution. How is it that you intend to use it? If I'm using an image that's the size of a postage stamp, but I'm going to place it in a PowerPoint document and I need it to take up the full screen, well, then I really need to be concerned about the resolution of that image. So that might not be the appropriate resolution or size. So you always definitely want to check the image size and resolution first. Before you go in and, and start doing all of this manipulation of the image, is it actually going to fit for the way you're going to use it? Next, we want to duplicate the image. So once I make sure that, yes, indeed, this image is the appropriate size and resolution, I want to always keep a backup copy. So I duplicate my image. Next, I'll make what we call global adjustments. In this case, I'm looking at the image overall. Okay? And I'm going to adjust things like the tonal range, which is the light and dark. What is the brightness of the image? Is it too dark? Is it too light? I'm going to adjust for that globally for the whole image. I'll also adjust for what we call white balance. And we saw that with the image of Phil there. It was a little green. So that means that there was some minor tweak that maybe could have been made in camera, but was maybe overlooked. So I can adjust that white balance so that the colors are true to life. Once I finish those global adjustments, then I start looking at what we call localized adjustments. Now this is where I can go in and make smaller adjustments to specific areas in the image. And once again, I might be looking at things like Tonal adjustments. Maybe there's a shadow that's a little too dark, or maybe there's a hot spot in there that's a little too bright, and I want to tone it down. Those are localized adjustments. I don't want to adjust the entire image, just a specific area. The same holds true with color adjustments. Maybe I don't like the color of uh, you know, my, my model's shirt, or maybe my product, uh, if it's a product shot, maybe I don't like the color of that. I can adjust the color in just that one area of the photograph. So global adjustments, the overall look and feel, and then the localized adjustments where I can go in and fine tune specific areas within the photograph. Next, I'll start taking a look at image repairs. So like I remove the buttons from the shirt there. That might be an image repair. You may have other uh, media, uh, other content in there that you really just don't want in your image. Maybe it's power lines or, or a mailbox or who knows what it might be, and you want to remove that. It could be a blemish uh, on the model's face. 
um, or, or something like that that you want to remove. And so image repairs. And then finally, we're going to save this as a master file. And then I could come back to this master file and modify it for maybe different types of output. So maybe I convert this master file, maybe I save another copy of it out and I make it a black and white version. Or maybe make one that is, well, maybe oversaturated, really, really colorful for a PowerPoint presentation. Who knows? In the end, you have a master file that you can work with. So this is a, a nice little list here, and I'm going to provide this PowerPoint deck for you so you have this list. This is the order in which I normally perform these tasks, and it, it falls in any genre of photography or however it is you plan to use it. Like I said, I've worked for magazines and, and packaging companies and marketing companies, and, and it always seems to come back to the same workflow. No matter what it is I'm working on, I go back to that same workflow, and it works every single time, no matter what the image is. Now, there's always adjustments that can be made to suit a specific need, so feel free to experiment there as well. All right, let's dive back in and see what else we've got. So, let's take a look at this image again. Okay, so I'm going to just go back here and uh, I'm going to remove the uh, buttons layer here. I'm going to remove the color balance here. So I'm going to start off with just this uh, raw image. Okay. So here's the original image. And I want to make sure that, well, is this image large enough for how I intend to use it? And is it high enough resolution for how I intend to use it? So how do we do that? Well, for this, I'm going to go to the image menu. Now remember what I said, most everything in here is a destructive change. So I'm not really going to make a change in here, but I am going to use it to help me find out some more information about this file. So I'm going to use this option here, image size. With image size, I am allowed to uh, take a look at the original size of this image. Where is it now? I can see it's physical file size, so this particular file is 51.3 megabytes. I can see its physical dimensions, and this is laid out in pixels, so it's 3456 by 5184 pixels. Then below, I can have a look at maybe making changes to this. Now, I don't want to make any changes, okay, so I just simply want to look at these. Now, it's giving me this, uh, this measurement here in pixels. Okay, and you'll note that the width and the height are chained together here. So if there's a change to the width, it will automatically and proportionately adjust the height. But what if pixels are not your thing? It's like, well, I'm not sure how many pixels I need, but I do know that it needs to be, let's say, uh, six inches tall. Well, I can simply change the unit of measure here. So you can see we have percentages, pixels, inches, we have metric, and then if you really want to get down into it, you have points and picas for your page layouts. So if I switch this to inches, I can see that, well, wow, check that out. I've got a 48 inch file by, wow, six foot tall, so a four by six image here. Man, that's a life size poster. Well, maybe not. The real gotcha here is this one, the resolution. This is the concentration of pixels per square inch. So in this particular image, it is uh, 72 pixels per square inch. Now that works fine for uh, online viewing, okay? So when we're addressing things like a website, or maybe I'm going to publish this as a PDF, basically the end use of this file is going to be on some sort of display. Okay? The 72 pixels per inch, well, that's not bad. That's not a bad concentration. Uh, some of the higher end uh, laptops and um, uh, the iPads with the uh, high res displays, they could actually go a little higher. You could probably go up to about 150 pixels per inch and, and have a really nice looking image. 
But the good rule of thumb here for, like I said, mobile and, and just online and, and device viewing is around 72 to 96 pixels per square inch. Now that is the finished size of your image. So that means that this huge image right here, well, it would display rather large unless the device shrinks it down, okay? So how is that going to help me if I'm going to print this image? Am I going to get that life-size poster? Well, you could, but you'll actually see those pixels there. And you've experienced this before when you've worked with images, and they look a little blocky, what we call pixelated. You actually see little squares of color in there. And that's because you lack the resolution. You don't have enough pixels per square inch. So in the web world, and like I said, viewing on screen, 72 to 96. When we start moving up into printing, well, we need to up that resolution, okay? So think about uh, desktop printing. You're gonna print to a local printer. Oh, you could probably go around 125, 150 pixels per square inch. Anything above that, yeah, you're really probably just wasting space. That particular device probably can't handle anything more than that. If you're gonna send this to be professionally printed, I want my own life-size poster of Mr. Phil hanging here in the office. So I'm gonna send it to be professionally printed. So for that, I'm gonna need something much higher resolution because it's a much higher quality print that's gonna be coming out of there. So I need somewhere around 240 to 300 pixels per inch. All right, well, how do we make a change to this or how do we identify, well, is this image large enough for one of those life-size prints? Let's take a look. So as I said, the trick here is the resolution. You wanna keep an eye on that relative to your width and height. Now, I can go in here and I can modify this number. It's going to allow me to do it. And it's gonna do this thing called resampling here. It's going to try to resample it based on one of these methods, okay? Now, this is what we call interpolation. It works pretty well in Photoshop. I have to admit, Adobe's gotten better and better at it but I'm not gonna be able to take a 72 DPI image here, or PPI, pixels per inch image, and crank it all the way up to 300. That's just not gonna happen. You're gonna see uh, those pixels no matter what I do here. That's too far of a jump. So what I really wanna do is find out, well, well, how big can I print this at that 300 pixels per inch? So I'm gonna click on this uh, resample here. I'm gonna click uh, the little check mark here to uncheck it. And you'll see what happens. It, it ties together the width, the height, and the resolution. Okay. Now, I'll take that resolution. I say, all right, well, we want to have this thing uh, printed high resolution, and my print provider told me it needs to be 300 pixels per inch. So I'll type in that value. Look at my width and height. I'm no longer that life-size poster. Now I'm down to, well, you know, 11 and a half by 17 and a quarter. So still a nice size print, but nothing like a life size poster here. So if I'm okay with this, if this image um, on those dimensions, that width and that height at that resolution is what I want, then I will cancel this and I can continue working. I don't want to change it, so I'm going to cancel it. But if this is not going to fit, let's say I really want that life-size print, well, then I'm probably going to have to go back and take another photo at a much higher resolution. All right, so I'm going to cancel this. But that's a quick way for you to find out, you know, is this image going to be large enough for the way I intend to use it? So I'm going to cancel that. So that's the, my first step, yes. I have identified that this image is, in fact, large enough for the way I intend to use it. Now, I could have reduced the resolution or reduced the size, but honestly, I like to work with these really high-res photos and then export them at lower-res quality. So I just leave it alone. If it's good enough, I'm just going to work with it that way. The next step is to duplicate this image. So for me, that is typically going to the File menu, choosing Save As, and then selecting Photoshop as my file type. So let me talk about that for just a moment. This image started life as a JPEG, and that is a very common file format for digital cameras. 
So um, JPEGs are inherently lossy. So what does that mean, William? Well, that just means that they lose data every time we save over them. So if I make a change here in Photoshop and I save it as a JPEG file, Photoshop has to recompress that file and I lose data each and every time I do that. So anytime I am working with digital imagery like this and they come in as a JPEG file, the first thing I do is duplicate them. And that duplicate copy that I'm about to make here is going to be a Photoshop file. Now Photoshop doesn't suffer from that type of compression, that lossy compression. If you're working at a native Photoshop file, you can edit it to your heart's content, save it a thousand times if you want, and you're not adversely affecting the file itself. Okay? So just a quick tip for you there. Stay away from those JPEGs when you're going to be modifying your file. Save it as a Photoshop file, work on it, make your edits as a Photoshop file, and then when you're ready to put this on your website or in your PowerPoint deck, then you can convert it or save out an additional version as a JPEG, a ping, a GIF, whatever it is you want. Okay? So let's jump back in here and let's take a look at this workflow. So we've, we've checked the image size, it's good to go. We're going to save as and we're going to keep working. All right, so I'm going to save this one out and I'm just going to rename it real quick here. Okay, so now I have my Photoshop file and now I'm ready to start working. So one of the first things I want to do is to go ahead and take a look at the overall light and dark of the image, the tonal property. Now for me, I use the adjustments panel. Okay, so over here in the adjustments panel, I have all kinds of options here. That top row there, Pretty much all of these, except for the last one there, the Vibrance, and I really don't know why they put it up there. I guess maybe just to balance it out a little bit. But um, these first four here are all about tonal, okay? So I have a brightness and contrast. I have levels. I have curves, and I have exposure. I'll tell you this, that the brightness and contrast, one that I don't really use a whole lot, um, it will adjust pretty much what it says, the overall brightness and the contrast. The contrast is the play between light and dark. Um, and it works pretty well um, in, in a lot of situations, but in this one, I can also see that I have a, a rather extreme color cast here. I have that kind of greenish yellow color going on. So the brightness and contrast can't handle that. And I'd rather use a tool that can handle both the tonal property and that color cast. So the next one on the list here is the levels adjustment. And this is the one that I usually start with. And it really doesn't matter what the image is, if it suffers from a color problem or not, I usually always start with levels. So I'm going to apply that. Now when I do, the properties panel lights up. Now yours may do uh, the same thing, but that properties panel might not, might not show up right here. It may show up in a different location. You can always move it if you so choose. Okay. But the properties panel is the settings for the adjustment layer that I just applied. So if you look in the layers panel down here, you'll see the background layer. That's the original photo. And then right above it, here is my levels one adjustment. So this properties is dealing with that levels one adjustment layer. So these are the settings for it. Now, how do we use this? Well, there's probably a little more than what we can get into here, but let me see if I can explain the basics. What this is trying to do is adjust the light, which is represented over here on the right side with this little slider, and the dark of the image, which is represented by this dark gray slider here. And then there is the midtones here in the center, this kind of medium gray. So if I were to take the white slider, now that, notice that there's two sets of sliders here. This bottom set down here, uh, I want you to just ignore that that even exists. That's really, really uh, more for um, uh, output and it's kind of specialized. So just ignore that for the time. If I take this white slider on top and I drag it to the left, look at my image. It keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter. So Phil is standing on the sun at this point. So obviously there's a certain amount, you know, where it's too much. Okay, so I'll just drag that back. 
Now, the dark gray slider here on the left-hand side, well, it does just the opposite. It's going to darken the image down. So what these two sliders are doing are looking at the shadow areas and then the highlight areas and adjusting them. Now, as we adjust these, this little guy here in the center, the little gray one, he's just, he's kind of neutral. He just says, well, I'll just hang out wherever you guys want me to. I'm going to kind of stay balanced between the white and the dark uh, sliders here. But he too can be moved. So I'm going to pull my black or uh, my black point slider back here, the dark slider. And I'm going to grab that middle slider here. Now, if I grab him, what he's going to do is take and, and adjust either lighter if I go to the left or darker if I go to the right. So what he's doing is he's adjusting all the values that fall between the highlights and the shadows. So the highlights represented by the white slider, shadows represented by the dark gray slider. So this little guy kind of fits in between. So uh, a lot of times you'll hear people refer to this as the gamma okay, of the image. So maybe what I'll do is he normally sits at 1.00. So maybe what I'll do is I'll push him just to the left a little bit to kind of brighten up the image overall. Looks pretty good. And then the white point, I think I'm going to push it to the left just a little bit to kind of brighten up some of this area up here. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Now, is there uh, a correct value for these? Well, it's going to change. Images are a lot like snowflakes. There's no two alike. And so when we're working with content like this, you're going to have to just learn uh, the feel for it, what looks right for the way you intend to use it. Okay? So practice, practice, practice. That's all I can tell you about this. I'll give you some pointers here as to what to look for as you're making this adjustment, but you're really just going to have to get in there and experiment for yourself. All right, let's dive back in here and let's, let's go ahead and finish this image off. So I am just adjusting a little bit for the, for the highlights here and right here in the midtones. Uh, and I think the midtones are a little too much there. I'm going to pull them back just a touch. Okay. Now, what about this green cast here? Okay. I could maybe adjust that with the color balance tool. You saw me do that earlier, but let me show you a little bit different technique. In this particular image, I would look for something that should be either pure white or pure black. Okay? And if I can't find that, then I have to look for something that should be what we would call a neutral gray. It is just kind of like devoid of color. And if I can find any one of those three items, there's three little eyedroppers here. Okay? Now normally I try to avoid the gray eyedropper because you can get a lot of trouble with that one. That's the one here on the left hand side of the properties panel in the middle. Normally I try to go for either a white point or a black point adjustment. So I'm going to start with the black point adjustment. What I want to look for is the darkest area of this image. So that's going to be maybe down here at, uh, at his feet in the shadow image to me just a little too dark. And it's also not adjusting for that kind of greenish cast. Now it really depends on the image. Now I could also try say here on his pants. Eh, it's not bad, but it's really not getting the job done. Okay. So the white point is the same way. If I grab the white slider here, is there anything that is white in this image? Or at least close to white? Unfortunately, no. I could try this uh, highlight over his head, and it's not bad, but it's still a little bit to the green side. So fortunately for me, on this particular image, down here in the lower right-hand corner, there is a little gray metallic pole here. And this holding my reflector that I was using for this. So I'm going to use the gray point uh, eyedropper here. And I'm going to click on that little guy. And look at that. It sucked out all of that yellowish green color. Now, check this out. I'm going to go over here to my layers panel. All of this is happening on this levels one adjustment. If I poke the eyeball for that, this takes us back to the original color. Now I'm going to turn the eyeball back on and look at that. So you don't always get to use the little gray eyedropper here. Sometimes you'll have to do this manually. Hopefully you can find something that's either a pure white or a pure black, and you can use one of those other two sliders for that.
Now, if you have to do it manually, you may want to rely on the color balance tool instead. It's a little more user friendly. Okay, so now I have my tonal properties adjusted. I have that color uh, overall adjusted. It looks nice and balanced here. What's next? Well, next we start diving into specific areas of the photograph that may need adjustment. So one of the things that I can see here is, well, I've got a lot of extraneous information here. I've got a little poster here in the background. I've got a little green screen here. I've got my, whoops, I've got my uh, reflector here. I really don't want that. That's a little distracting here. So what about cropping the image? Sure. I go over here to the left and I locate my crop tool. Now this is gonna be up there near the top of the tools panel. So the crop tool allows me to basically trim out a specific area of the photograph. Now, what I trim out is what I'm going to keep. So it's like trimming the edges off an oversized uh, photograph here. And the way this thing works is that you have these little adjustment handles in the corners, okay? You also have them here on the sides. You can uh, set up here in the tool options a specific size that you would like to um, hit, you know, a specific size you'd like to end up with, uh, or you can just leave it as a ratio and you can set up maybe, uh, let's say a 16 by, oops, I hit a 19 there. How about a 16 by uh, nine ratio? Okay, so I could do something like that and get a, a widescreen shot here or I'll just clear that out. So there's a clear option here, okay? And now I'm free to just adjust this crop any way I see fit. So I'm just gonna drag the handles and I'm just gonna crop in really close to Mr. Phil here. There we go. I'm gonna give him just a little more room here at the top. Awesome. And you can see I've got, he looks like he's in a cage here, this little, uh, this little grid here. This is a rule of thirds, so this kind of helps me line up the shot the way I want. Okay, now, cropping a photo can also be destructive, okay? Fortunately, for the newer versions of Photoshop, they have made the crop tool non-destructive. So if I crop this out and then later on decide, whoa, I didn't give, uh, I didn't give enough room here on the right-hand side or the bottom side or something like that, I can always come back in an adjustment. So right up here at the top, there's a small option here that says, has a little trash can on it. If that is on, then it is going to physically remove those extraneous pixels. It's going to trim out that uh, this crop area and throw those pixels away. So I'm gonna make sure that is turned off because I may want to come back in and recrop this photo later. I'm gonna click on this check mark up here to accept that crop, okay? So now I've cropped the image out, but check this out. If I go back over here and I click on the crop tool again, you see it brings up my little crop handles and I'm gonna grab one of the crop handles. Look at that. All that information is still here. It's just being hidden from view. So if I decided that, well, I wanted to crop a little bit tighter, I can recrop it. Or if I decide, well, no, I think I want to open it up a little more. I want to get a little more of that background in that environment. I can do that. So now we've got a nice crop. Okay. Now, what about those individual areas that I may want to manipulate? One of the areas that I can see here that's a little dark, perhaps, is down here at his pants. Now, he wore dark colored pants, and so I want to see if I can lighten that up a little bit and maybe capture some of the texture uh, that's in the pants here. So I'm going to just zoom in, and there's a zoom tool down there near the bottom of your tools panel. Looks like a magnifying glass. And the way it works is you just click on it and then you can come out here and click on the screen or you can click and drag to create a box and then when you release, it zooms in on that box. So I've zoomed in here. And now how will I make this adjustment? Okay, now if I go back over here to the adjustments panel, I, I can see that the properties for that levels adjustment is still active, okay? That's because that layer is still active. So I want to make a new adjustment, okay? 
It could be another levels adjustment, it could be a brightness and contrast, it could be any of these, okay? So let me just, uh, I'm gonna give the brightness contrast a try here. And so I click on the little brightness contrast, it adds a new layer, and then I can adjust the sliders here. So if I go to the left, it gets dark. If I go to the right, it gets a little brighter. Okay, so now I'm starting to get there. Not too bad. I'm gonna take the contrast down maybe a little. Okay. So I can start to bring back some of those details. I can't bring them all back, but I am bringing back some of the details. But here's the problem. It's affecting the entire image, not just that one specific area. So over here in the Layers panel, anytime you use one of these adjustments, okay, any of these adjustments here, it adds a layer, and then it adds this little box on that layer, this big white box here. This is a mask. And the thing that you have to remember about a mask is that white reveals and black hides. So in the case of an adjustment, it is revealing that adjustment. It is actually applying that adjustment everywhere. Now what if I change that mask? Okay. So if I go up to the image menu and I choose um, adjustments here and I choose this, invert. So invert means basically flip upside down, turn inside out basically go to the polar opposite, okay? Because I had that mask on that layer selected, it inverted that mask. So what was white is now black. And so that adjustment that I have made with that brightness and contrast, well, it's being hidden from view because black hides. So I need to show that adjustment just here on his pants, okay? So what I'll do is I'll grab a selection tool and maybe make a selection of his pants and then cut a hole in that mask so that that adjustment will show through. Now, for the purposes uh, of me using Photoshop, I, I just absolutely refuse to use a tool like Photoshop without this little guy that's in my hand. Uh, this is a, a Wacom tablet. It's a graphics tablet. You don't have to use this at all. You can certainly use the mouse to do what I'm about to do. Uh, but for me, uh, a graphics tablet is the way to go. It's more natural feeling. I can draw with a pencil rather than a mouse. Okay, So uh, you're going to see me doing that here, and you're probably hearing it rattling around as we go. Um, it's a, it's a really neat feature, but it's not absolutely necessary, okay? So I'm gonna make a selection using my pencil here, and I'm gonna just draw a selection. Let's take a look. Okay, so what I want is to use the lasso tool in this case. Now, why the lasso tool? Well, a lasso tool is a selection tool, and there's three different versions of it. I prefer the very first one here, the lasso tool. Okay. It is very much a freehand tool. It works kind of like a pencil. So in my case, I'm using this tablet. So as long as my stylus, my pencil, is touching the tablet, I'm drawing with the lasso tool. The moment I release or pick up my pencil, I stop drawing. Now with your mouse, it works the same way, except you're holding down the mouse button to start drawing. The moment you release the mouse button, you stop drawing, okay? So for me, this is a real irregular shape, so I'm going to use the lasso tool for that because it tends to lend itself for irregular shapes. I can just kind of trace around the bottom of Mr. Phil's coat and then down his pants legs here. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to trace down the side, and I'm going to do this very, very quickly. And this is why I use the Wacom tablet, because it is so uh, user-friendly for me. It does take a little bit of used to, but it's more natural feeling, okay? And so I can just trace right around that edge. If I need to add a little more, I can just trace right around where I need to add some more and just add that to my selection, okay? I'm going to grab a little bit more right here underneath his coat, okay? 
Nice. Okay, so I could certainly spend more time cleaning that up, but for our purposes here, this will do. So I've highlighted his uh, pants here, and now what I want is just to make sure that over here in the Layers panel, I still have that mask selected, and that mask is solid. So now what I can do is I can hit my Backspace or my Delete key, and look at that. You can see his pants. You can see the highlights on his pants there. Okay, so now that's pretty cool. Now I want to stop using that selection, okay? If I go up to the select menu here, there's an option to deselect, okay? So you can see that my selection maybe wasn't exactly perfect. Now in a destructive environment, well I'd have to just start all over again. But I'm not using a destructive adjustment. Okay. I'm using a mask, which helps me to adjust or, or modify this adjustment as often as I like. It's totally non-destructive. So I'm going to zoom in over here on the right side here where I see this problem. See, there's a little bit too much of that leaking out. And now I can still adjust that mask. Now, for something as simple as this or as small as this, I'm going to use the brush tool. And with the brush tool, and I have, oops, I still have this guy selected, the mask. I'm going to paint with my foreground color of black because I'm going to add black to the mask. And what does black do on the mask? Well, it adds to the mask, which is going to hide. Okay. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to select a brush and just start painting with it. And as I paint, you can see that highlight is kind of disappearing. It's hiding that adjustment. Okay. I'm going to zoom in here a little closer to make it a little easier for you to see. So here is that hard edge where I have that adjustment. That mask is kind of leaking over here into the carpet. And so what I can do with this brush is just come in, paint black on that mask to hide that adjustment. And now my carpet looks normal again. Isn't that cool? So it's very flexible, very um, you know, easy to manipulate the image. It does take a little practice, I will give you that. But I am targeting a specific area. Okay. Now, along with that non um, non-destructive editing. Now that I've opened up or brightened up that area on his pants, I'm starting to see a little bit of a red tint in there. So now this means that I can go back in and color adjust that one specific area. So let's take a look at that, and then that's gonna wrap it for this particular project, and, uh, and then we'll see what comes up next. Okay, so um, Let's, let's see what we can do here. As I said, the, the highlights there are just a little bit red to me. So what I want to do is make an adjustment. Now, uh, in this case, I want to make a selection first, okay? So I'm going to cheat here, okay? This is a great little, uh, a little productivity tip for you. I already have a selection over here. Remember where I selected um, the pants? And I um, use that to knock a hole in this mask over here on the right. So what I'm gonna do, on a PC, I'm gonna hold down the Control key. On a Mac, that would be the Command or Apple key, and I'm gonna click on that mask. Now when I do that, look at what's happening on the photograph. I'm getting that selection again. So I have converted that mask back into a selection temporarily. Well, what happens here is if I have an active selection, and then I make an adjustment. I'm going to make, oh, let's, let's just do uh, a color balance adjustment here. As soon as I click on that color balance adjustment, my selection animation, the marching ants, they disappear because they become yet another mask. Look over there in the layers panel. I now have a color balance and I have that same mask. Isn't that cool? So now I can go in here and I can start playing around with, maybe I'll deal with the shadows here a little bit, um, but I can start playing around. Is it too red? I can pull a little bit of the red out of there, a little bit of the magenta out of there. 
Pull a little bit of yellow. Nice. There we go. Perfect. So, once again, if I want to see kind of a before and after or undo and redo, I can just click on the little eyeball here for that color balance. So there, the highlights were a little bit red, kind of a purplish color. But once I apply that color balance to that specific area, nice and neutral. It looks like he's got on uh, a natural black colored slacks there. Very, very cool. So there you have it, making your localized adjustments, targeting specific areas within your photograph and making those adjustments. Now, what's next? I'm going to save this file and this is going to be my master file. And really that's it. I can come back to this file again and again. I need to export it for use in other applications. So I could export it, say, as a JPEG or a PNG or what have you. And I can do that multiple times. I can also come back to this native Photoshop file and continue to edit it as I see fit. So that's it. We're going to show you a little more about that part of the process a little later this afternoon uh, when we start publishing some of these projects. So I'm going to save this project as is, and then we're going to move on to the next project. But before we do that, I think we're going to let everybody take a break for just a moment. Hello and welcome back to Brightstream TV. I'm your host, William Everhart, and in this episode, we're looking at Adobe Photoshop. Now, this is a sprint course, so we're trying to take you from start to finish here. It's kind of a crash course here on Photoshop, and this is really just the basics. We're just really touching uh, the tip of the iceberg on this one because this tool is so powerful and can just do so, so much. But hopefully we'll give you a good understanding of how to use it and, and how to implement it in your own workflow. So uh, at the beginning of the show here, we talked about uh, the interface and kind of locating the tools and the things that we need to use Photoshop. And then we started moving into the uh, different workflows here, like a, a typical image editing workflow. And that's kind of where we left things. We had made some localized adjustments and, uh, and next, we, we really need to make maybe some corrections. Now, the particular photograph that we were working on really didn't need any corrections, but it's at this point we have made our tonal adjustments, our color adjustments, and we've made those localized tonal and color adjustments. And so now it's a matter of the image repairs. So while this image really doesn't have any repairs, we could take a look at maybe uh, some possibilities here. Well, let's dive back into Photoshop here and uh, let's see if we can make some corrections of this photo and then export it out. All right, so uh, there's really not any major corrections that need to be made to this, any blemishes that need to be made to this image. But really this is the point where we would make those types of changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up another photograph. And this is an area where, well, there's all kinds of possibilities for changes or um, blemishes that could be repaired. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to open uh, another image here. I have a profile photo. And I don't know who that ugly rascal is, but he could use a lot of work. So let's, uh, let's see if we can uh, maybe manipulate this photograph a little bit and maybe make some repairs. Now, it doesn't always have to be, say, a portrait. It could be, as I said, it could be a, uh, an external shot and you just want to remove, say, something that's a little unsightly, like a mailbox or some power lines or things like that that you want to remove from an image. How do we go about doing that? And keep in mind that we want to do this in a non-destructive manner. So this image has already been color balanced and already been adjusted for the light and dark here. And it is a little to the dark side, but that was kind of the mood or, or the feeling that we wanted to get from this. So now it's just a matter of going in and cleaning up uh, some, of, um, some of the blemishes here. Now this too is a JPEG file. So one of the first things I'll do is I'm gonna just go ahead and save this as a Photoshop file. So I'm gonna go to my file menu. I'm gonna choose save as. And I'm just going to change the mode here. So 
Photoshop realizes that it's a JPEG and that's what it chooses as its default because that's what it started life as, and I haven't made any adjustments to it. So it's going to assume that I want to keep it as a JPEG. Well, I don't. So I'm going to just click on the, uh, the uh, Save As type here, and I'm going to run right up here to the top, Photoshop. All right, and I'll just save it. Okay, so now I have my duplicate copy. Now, I could also go ahead and run those other adjustments if I wanted to. So, like I said, I always start with, like, my levels adjustment, okay? And let's say in this case I want to just brighten it up just a little bit. I want to bring out some of uh, the texture there in my jacket. So I'm just using this midpoint slider here in the levels adjustment to pull that back a little bit and just kind of brighten up that area a little bit. Okay, great. Not a major adjustment, just a little tweak, okay? Once again, totally non-destructive because it's on a layer by itself. And that is a global adjustment. It's happening everywhere in the photograph. Other things that I could do maybe just for, um, maybe just for the purpose of enhancing the photograph would be a localized adjustment. Okay. Now, we talked about masks a little bit earlier, and some of you got, had gotten disconnected and, and didn't, didn't quite catch that part on the mask or maybe part of it there. So I just want to review that just a moment. So I want to make an adjustment here to just a specific area in this photograph. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the lasso tool here. And once again, you can use the mouse or you can use, like for me, I'm going to use my Wacom tablet. And I am going to just trace around this face, okay, and I'm just going to do a very quick, rough job of this. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, okay, kind of going up into the hairline here a little bit, perfect, and if I need to add a little bit, whoops, I missed a little spot right there. That hairline seems to be receding a little bit, so let's go ahead and take care of that. Okay, so this skin tone here, um, Let's say I want to adjust that a little bit, okay? I'm making a localized adjustment. I don't want to adjust everything, just the skin tone. Over here on the right in that adjustments panel, okay, um, there is a thing called a photo filter. It looks like a little camera. I'm going to click on that. Now, just like the other um, adjustments here, it creates a new layer. But because I had an active selection, the little animation, what we call the marching ants, that little line that was wrapping around my face there, well, that uh, selection has been converted into a mask. And so what I'm telling Photoshop is apply this adjustment only to that area that I had uh, encircled with my lasso. Now you can use other selection tools. It really doesn't matter, Photoshop doesn't care. If you make any type of selection and then apply an adjustment with that active selection, it's going to convert that selection automatically into a mask for you. So now I'm just going to take this warming filter and I'm going to use the, uh, the 85, which is the first one, uh, and I'm just going to crank that up. And so what it does is kind of liven me up there a little bit. Um, this photo was taken here in the winter. You can see that in the background there. So I haven't been out in the sun quite as much. So uh, let's, let's warm me up there a little bit. There we go. And uh, that looks great. Now, once again, I can kind of see a before and after here by clicking on the little eyeballs beside the layers. So that's before, nice and pasty. Click after, ah, warmed up. Looks a little more human now. All right, now. Let's take a look at adjusting this mask a little bit more because I have applied this to my entire face. So it's not affecting anything else in the photograph. But there is one area that it probably shouldn't adjust. Let me zoom in here for a moment. You could probably guess already what it should not have adjusted. And that is my eyes. So the whites of my eyes are a little yellow now because of that um, photo filter. So I want to modify the mask. I don't have to apply another adjustment on top of it trying to pull the, the color back. I simply have to hide this adjustment, this photo filter adjustment. To do that, 
I use a paintbrush, okay? So I go over here and I grab my brush tool, okay? And then I go down here to the bottom. My foreground color is the color that I paint with. And when I'm working on a mask, that can be black or white or any level of gray in between. Now let's say I decided to choose a different color, okay? To change the color of either your foreground or your background, you just double click on that little item. I'm gonna double click on this little black swatch here. Click, click, okay? So I'm gonna pick red. I'm gonna tell it okay. Look right here in this foreground color. Is that red? Nope. Because I'm working on a mask, it will not allow me to select colors. It converts that red into its grayscale equivalent. Okay, well that's called all fine and well, but that's only when we're working on masks. So what I wanna do is I wanna switch this back to black. A really neat little tool here that's built in for you is right below this fill uh, or this foreground and background color, and it's the default uh, foreground background colors. So if I click on that, it's gonna reset it to a white foreground, black background. Okay, well, that means I'm painting with white, okay? On a mask, that means it's going to reveal that adjustment. Well, that adjustment's already revealed here on my eyes. I want to hide it. So I need to switch the foreground for the background color. On the upper right-hand corner of my foreground and background, there's a little arrow that's kind of in the corner. If I click on that, it switches them. So now my foreground color is black, and black painted on a mask is going to hide that adjustment. So now I can go in here, and I'm gonna make my brush just a little bit larger, and I can paint out that yellow adjustment. So my eyes are nice and white again. Great, I'll do that to this side. And if I, go, if I go outside the lines there a little bit, if I go out onto my eyelids a little bit, that's okay. There's not a whole lot here that you're gonna miss, but the whiteness of the eyes, you will see that. Okay, now, some of the adjustments here that we can make, some of the corrections. Maybe another localized color adjustment here would be, well, the color of my eyes. So, uh, my eyes are blue and they, they do tend to change. My wife says they get gray when I get a little mad, so uh, <laughs> I don't know about that, but what if I want to just enrich in the blue that's already in my eyes? I really want those to stand out. Okay, well that's another color adjustment. And once again, I could go in and I could just paint that color in there, but that would be a destructive process. So in order to avoid that, I want to uh, uh, make this adjustment via that adjustments panel over there, okay? And once again, I want to maybe just select just the blue area of my eyes so I can make another selection. Now for me, because this area is so small, I really don't, I don't make the selection first. What I do is I go ahead and make the color adjustment first. So I'm gonna go over here to the adjustments panel. Now the color is already here in my eyes, okay? Maybe I just need to bring it out a little more. I don't really need to change the color, I just need to um, enrich it a little bit. So for this, I'm gonna use this little guy up here in the adjustments panel, and it's a little upside down triangle here, and it's called Vibrance. So if I click on that, okay, it adds a new Vibrance adjustment layer and an empty mask, the white box, white, reveals. So that means whatever I do in here, I'm going to crank up the saturation. You see, it affects everything. So, let me reset that. I'm going to use the Vibrance slider on this. Now, the Vibrance slider um, is really nice because what it does is it tends to look at areas that are not so saturated, not so colorful, and just enrich in them a little bit. Everything else, it tends to leave alone. Now the saturation slider, well, that kind of turns things into Willy Wonka's wonderful world of candy making here, and it just goes crazy with the colors. So there's a time and a place for both. In this case, the saturation is a bit overkill. So I'm gonna reset that. 
Okay. And I'm gonna leave the vibrance turned up a good bit here. Now, if I toggle the visibility of that adjustment on and off, so there it is off, and here it is turned on. You can see that it made my skin more red, more yellow. It's just amplifying the colors that are already there. Well, I don't want that happening everywhere. So like I did before with the uh, image of Phil and trying to adjust just a particular area, I'm going to take and invert this mask. So over here in the layers panel, I've got the mask targeted, the little brackets around the white box on the vibrance layer. I go up to the image menu and I choose adjustments, invert. So what was white is now black. And so now it is completely hiding that adjustment altogether. To reveal that just in the area of my eyes, I paint, once again with my paintbrush, but this time with white. So I switch my foreground and background colors so that I'm painting with white, and now I can paint just over the irises of my eye here, like so, and on this side. And it's a real subtle adjustment here, but now that I've got that area targeted, I can go back and because the vibrance adjustment that I made is non-destructive, I can double click on that vibrance adjustment layer to bring back the properties panel. So now I can revisit the vibrance. Is that high enough? Okay. Maybe I could take it a little higher. Okay. Maybe I could use a little bit of the saturation and pull that up. Okay. So whatever it is that you do, just know that by using this in a non-destructive method, you can make these adjustments again and again. You can revisit them. And that's the really cool thing about this. Now, earlier I showed you how you could duplicate these masks. So let's say I want to change the color of my eyes, okay? I've lived with blue eyes all my life. Everybody in my family has blue eyes. So let's say that I want to be the odd man out. I want to change the color of my eyes. Well, that's just another color adjustment. So I only want to affect the irises here in my eye. Well, I already have a mask that uses that right here. If I hold down the control key, the command key on a Mac, and I click on that mask that shows just the irises of my eyes, you will see the little selection marching ants. So what I've done is I've converted that mask back into a selection or not really convert it. I've just loaded those pixels up as a selection. Okay. Now I have an active selection. If I apply another adjustment, it's only going to happen in these two areas. So I'm going to go right up here to the adjustments panel once again, and I'm going to use this one, the hue saturation. So with this one, what I can do is not only adjust the saturation. So there isn't a saturation slider here and I can crank it up and you can see my eyes going all crazy like, but what I can also do is change the color of my eyes using this hue slider. So if I drag this to the left, I can make my eyes even more blue. I drag it to the right, I can start making them a little bit green. Okay. There's also another option here. It's called colorize. So if the, the result here of the hue slider doesn't get you what you want, if it's too subtle, turn on colorize. And now it just simply fills that area with whatever color you want. So if I want, you know, purple eyes, who knows, whatever you want, you can get whatever you want here. You can get really crazy with this. Maybe I want some kind of green eyes here. Okay. I can reduce the lightness value so a little bit darker. They're not so crazy alien looking. And I can also increase or decrease that saturation to give it a little more of a natural feel. Now, once again, totally non-destructive. So as I look in here a little closer, I can see that, whoops, I'm getting a little bit of that green here on my eyelid. So when I was using the vibrance adjustment, we really didn't notice that. But now that I'm making this major color change, well, we see that. 
Well, these two masks are not tied to one another, so I can just adjust this mask. I use my brush tool and I use a black foreground color because I want to hide the green in this area. So I just paint along that edge to remove that. All right. Now, the brush. We saw this earlier, we could change the size of it. You can also change this value called the hardness. So if I reduce the hardness on this brush, that means it's gonna have a real diffused edge, okay? So now when I paint over this edge, it blends a little more uh, naturally. It's not as abrupt a change. So I just kind of paint along that edge with this diffused brush here, this soft edged brush. And that's gonna help kind of blend that image together here. Really, really nice. Okay. So now I've got my crazy green alien eyes. But hopefully that, that kind of helps you out with um, those masks there. So masks are a huge, huge feature when it comes to non-destructive editing. We can localize color adjustments or tonal adjustments or filters or anything else that you want to apply using a mask. Okay, so uh, once again, making these localized adjustments, uh, making image corrections now. How do we remove blemishes? Let's take a look at that, and then let's take a look at exporting these two photos. Okay, let's go back into Photoshop. All right, so now that I've got all these color adjustments here, what about blemish removal, okay? So if I zoom back in here, and you have to do this a lot on portrait work. And, I, and I'll tell you this, that, you know, us guys, we get out lucky because the more wrinkles and, and, and things that we have, the more distinguished looking we get, I guess. Uh, it's totally unfair, I know, uh, but that's just kind of the way it works. But, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of an overkill here. So maybe there's just a little blemish. Now, I have this little tag thing here right underneath my eye, and I don't want that, okay? So if I make an adjustment, First, I have to locate the picture layer, which is the background layer. Okay? If I make that adjustment to that layer, that's a permanent change. That's a destructive change, and I don't want that. So, I create a new layer immediately above the layer that I want to fix. So, I want to fix the picture layer. So, I'm going to target the picture layer first by clicking on it here in the Layers panel. And then at the bottom of the Layers panel, I'm just going to click to add a new layer. Now, I'm not asked to name the layer or anything else. It's just going to give me layer one, and that's fine. Then I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to use, well, let's go ahead and use that same old tool. This is my good buddy here, the Spot Healing Brush. Really like this tool. It's pretty intuitive. So once again, I want to make sure that I am looking at the tool options bar for this tool, and I wanna make sure this little layer feature is turned on so it can sample from all of the layers and not just the empty layer I'm working on. So, I just go up here and I just paint over this little area and it's gone. Now the other thing I can do with this is like little wrinkles that I have, okay? You can go in here and just wipe those out. And it does a pretty good job. Okay, so maybe across my forehead here, if I don't want these, I can just kind of paint across them. Look at that. Instant Botox, and I didn't even have to go to the doctor. Awesome. So any of these small blemishes, I could work that way. If there's something a little more pronounced, I would use this particular tool. But now I'm not gonna go over my entire face with this. I'll just find some of the uh, larger areas here, like a little bit of the razor rash there kind of thing, and just kind of clean this up. Okay. But there's other ways that you can go about this. Another type of adjustment that I can make to maybe smooth my skin out here a little bit would be to apply a, a blurring filter. Okay. Uh, there's several different techniques for this, so I'm not going to dive into it too deep, but let's just say that I could go back in and I could duplicate this background image. Okay, now to duplicate this original image, I simply drag it onto 
the new layer icon. Okay, so I'm just dragging the background image, and I'm going to drop it right on that new layer icon. And what it gives me is a duplicate copy. Pretty cool. Next, I can go up to the filter menu, and I can choose to blur this image. There's several different blurs. I'm going to stick with the most common one here, the Gaussian blur. Okay. And what it will do is if I sample an area here on my face, I can look at the radius here. This is basically the strength, the area that it's affecting. The higher I go up with it, the blurrier this image will get. Now, the higher the resolution of the image, and this one's pretty high, the higher I have to go up with this before we actually see a change. So you see that once I crank it on up here, now I'm kind of fading off in the background there. So obviously I don't need to go that far, but I'm going to pull it back so that the skin is looking a little smoother here. And like I said, this is just one little quick technique. Nothing major here. It's working pretty good. And so I'll just tell it okay. All right. So if I turn that layer off, here's the before, and we can see all the little details, all the little pores. Here's the after. Okay. So a lot of those details are being hidden, but it also looks like the image is out of focus. Okay. That's because all of the detail areas, my hair, my eyes, uh, my mouth, all that stuff is out of focus too. So once again, what you would want to do is use a mask here. So to add a mask to an image layer, well, we just go down here to the layers panel, and with that duplicate layer selected, I just tell Photoshop to add a layer mask. And that's this little icon right here at the bottom. It's a little box with a hole in it. Now, if I just add a mask just by clicking on it, it's going to be an empty mask. So it really didn't hide anything. Now, I'm going to undo that. Okay. One of the other cool things about these little tools here at the bottom is that clicking on them gives you a specific function. Okay. So in this case, it adds an empty mask. If I hold down the Alt key, and that would be the Option key on a Mac, and I click that same button. So I've removed the mask. I'm going to add it again, but I'm going to this time hold down the Alt or Option key. This time, it adds a solid mask. So now it's completely hiding that, um, that image with the blur on it. Okay. So here's what I do. Now I can go in, and I can use, once again, my brush tool, and I can put it in uh, painting with white here and give me a really large brush. Okay, and then I can start painting in. And I'm actually going to zoom in here on my cheek so you can see this happening. So you can see all the details here in my cheek. Now, if I start painting on this mask, I am revealing the blur underneath. Look at that. So I can selectively blur these areas. And I can avoid areas like my mouth and my eyes. And so now I'm removing some of this detail by just adding, uh, selectively adding a blur over the top. Now, like I said, this is a very simplistic method here. There are certainly other methods for doing this. But I just want to show you something really quick and easy that you can do right now today um, using any portrait, actually any image. Anywhere you need to selectively blur, you can do this sort of thing. So now that's pretty cool. And I'm just going to kind of paint right here and just kind of paint right up into the hairline there. Okay. And there we go. So uh, once again, just using the mask to your advantage to selectively adjust areas. Now, everything I've shown you so far works well inside of Photoshop. And I know there was a question earlier about Photoshop Elements. Now, Elements will have some of these adjustments. Uh, elements, I do not believe, has the ability for masking. So that's probably one of the areas where you may run into an issue or a disconnect between Photoshop and Photoshop Elements. Okay. So now that I've made these corrections uh, to my photograph, how do we export these photographs so that we can maybe publish this on a web page or put it into our PowerPoint presentation? Let's take a look. 
So now that I've got this uh, photograph, I've got all these layers over here. And for me, I generally keep those layers um, because I can always come back to this image, change the eye color, I can change my shirt color, I can change the background, I can do all kinds of creative things with this photograph as long as I keep it non-destructive. But I can't place a Photoshop file inside of PowerPoint, so I have to do something else. I have to export this as some other file type. Let me save this file first. Go to the File menu and simply choose Save. It's going to save it as that Photoshop format, so it's not losing any data. Next, to export this into something that I can use in PowerPoint, maybe I want a JPEG. Okay. I'm going to go up to the File menu, and I'm going to choose Export. Now there's several options in here, and this has changed over the last couple of versions of Photoshop. Now for me, the way I do this is I use this feature called Save for Web, and now they're calling it a legacy uh, type of thing because they, now they have this new export feature. But I, like, I still like using this. Top three formats. If I look up here in the top right corner of this display, I have a GIF, JPEG, ping. I also have a Windows bitmap file because I happen to be working on a Windows device. But those are the top three, in this case, four uh, image types that are commonly used uh, in web development. So, uh, in my case, I'm going to choose a JPEG. Now, why do I choose JPEG? Well, I don't have any transparency in this image, and I have a lots and lots of colors in it. So, I want to give the best range of colors, and a JPEG will do that. But JPEGs don't support transparency. Okay. Now, all I see is this big blurry mess here in the preview. Okay. This preview is actual size. If I look down here in the lower left-hand corner, it's going to give me some feedback about what I'm doing here. I'm saving this out as a JPEG. This is going to be the resulting file size, and this is going to be the time it takes to download this file on a dial-up modem. Okay. Right below that, this is the actual zoom level. So I generally leave this at 100%. Okay. So this is actual size. But I don't need anything quite this large. Let's say that I'm going to export this and I want to place it inside of my PowerPoint deck. And then I know that my PowerPoint slides are set up to a resolution of around um, 720 by 540, somewhere along there, kind of a 4 by 3 aspect ratio there. So why do I need an image larger than that? I don't. And I started out with a really high resolution photo. So over here in the lower right hand corner, so I worked on a high res photo and a really large photo. Well, I don't need it to be anywhere near this large. Notice that it's in pixels. It's always going to do that. It's going to put it in pixels for you. So I know that the height of my uh, PowerPoint deck here, let's say, or, or let's say my storyline um, uh, template file here, it has a height of 540 pixels. Well, look at this. I'm at 3600, almost 30, 3650 pixels tall. That's way more than what I need. So I'm going to make an adjustment here. I'm going to say that the height of this needs to be no higher than, I'm going to give myself a little bit of room, I'm going to say 600 pixels. Okay? So why didn't I make that adjustment in the image itself? Why didn't I just make that image smaller? Well, once again, it's that non-destructive editing. By choosing to export at a smaller size, I can always come back to this original Photoshop file and export for a larger, either a slide deck or maybe a poster. Maybe I want a life-size poster of myself to hang on the wall. So uh, that's why I do what I do here in Photoshop. I leave the sizing till the end, especially if I'm going down in size. So let's jump back in. Let's go ahead and save this out. So now that I've resized this, I'm still getting this big blob over here. So I'm just going to click in one of the other fields, and it's going to update that preview. So now you can see it's scaled it down to fit in this window. Nice. Now that's still at 100%. So there's still all of this image in here. And if I just kind of drag around in here, you can see the rest of the image. It's all there. The entire background is there. Okay. So um, now the file type. Okay. Like I said, I wanted a JPEG. 
then I can choose different quality ranges here. The higher the quality, the larger the file size. So if I leave this at high, okay, I can see that this image is 56.41K, and that's really not too bad. It's gonna take 11 seconds to download that on a dial-up modem. And you say, well, William, nobody has dial-up anymore. Oh, yes, they do. So be mindful of this, especially if you're going to uh, deploy these images um, over the web, whether that be your e-learning um, simulations, whether it be uh, you know, a website, whatever. Just be very mindful of this right here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and save it. And I'm gonna give this a name here, and I'm just gonna drop it. Do, do, do. Let's go. Oh, let's just put it on the desktop. Okay. And so now I've saved out that file. I've saved out that JPEG. And what that does for me is allow me to come back to this Photoshop file. Maybe I don't want the adjustment to my eyes. Okay. So maybe I feel like, oh, that was a little, little too nutty there. I want to go back to the natural look. So I can just turn off that adjustment layer and I can export it again as another file type or just rename it, okay? So that's pretty much it. Uh, that was kind of a whirlwind tour of taking an image from start to finish, making some color adjustments, some global adjustments there with color and tone, and then using masks to go in and target specific areas of a photograph to adjust those. And then finally, uh, using, uh, well, in this case, just one of the healing brushes to repair certain areas in the photograph. Now, there's obviously a lot more than, we, than what we can cover here in this particular course, but that gives you uh, just a basis of that workflow. How do we go about doing this, okay? You can spend as much time or as little time as you want in that workflow. It really depends on what your specific needs are. But I really encourage you to go ahead and try this and explore all the different avenues that you can with this non-destructive editing. All right, well, let's take a look at just a few more things that we can do. What about compositing images together? Now, earlier this year, I recorded a show all about compositing images. So if you'd like to take a look at a more in-depth view, be sure to check that out. Compositing images with Photoshop. But those of you who have tuned in today, I wanted to show you just one of the other techniques that we can do. We can composite or combine multiple images together right here inside of Photoshop. So let's take a look. All right. So um, I've got this image here. Uh, I'm going to open up another image. Okay. And, oh, I don't know. Let's say we're going to take a look uh, right here the computer. Okay, I'm going to open that up. And let's say I want to use this um, maybe as, um, you know, part of my marketing efforts or whatever this might be. But what's on the screen isn't relative to what I'm trying to market. Okay, so I need to swap that image out. I like the image overall. I like the tonal. I like the color. Everything's good. I just really need to swap out what's on the computer screen. Now, what I've done is I've created just a little snapshot. So I'm gonna go up here to the file menu. I'm gonna open, and I've got a little screenshot here. So I'm gonna open that up. And so here's my screenshot of Adobe Photoshop. Now I did this screenshot on a Macintosh here, so there's a little bit of Mac branding up there. And if I didn't want that, well, you, we know how to fix that, right? We can remove that type of content. That is just a simple edit. And I'll show you how to do that as well. But what I need to do is take this image and get it over here in this image. So how do we go about doing that? There's several different methods. Like I said, Photoshop is notorious for that. There's no one right way to do it. My preferred method is to take my base image and then instead of opening the other image, I'm going to go to the file menu and I'm going to place that image. 
Now in the later versions of Photoshop, we have two methods for placing. I'm going to choose this embedded method. And what it does is it makes a copy of this image, this screenshot that I'm about to use, and puts it inside this particular Photoshop file. So I will still have the original uh, screenshot image available, and if I make adjustments to that original image, it won't affect my layout here in this image. So I'm going to select the screenshot, I'm going to choose place. So I'm placing it embedded. Now it brings the image in, and it's just kind of square here, it's just kind of sitting here. Okay. Now I can manipulate this. I've got this big X on it, and I've got these little transform handles. That means that I can mouse here in the center, click and hold and drag, and I can move the image. If I mouse out here on the edge, I can actually rotate the image. Okay? And if I grab one of those handles here, I can actually change the size of this image, but I want to be careful because I can distort it as well. So, I'm just going to go ahead and distort it a little bit, just so we can see what's happening here. I want to resize this up, but oh my goodness, it was taken at a different angle. So the screenshot, of course, that's just a straight, um, like a straight photograph, like if my camera was straight on the, the screen here. But my actual photograph of my environment, well, my computer was at a slight angle to the camera. So I need to try and match up that angle as much as possible. Well, Photoshop allows me to do this. So I can continue to distort this image. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So the little transform handles here allow me to scale it vertically, rotate it, scale it horizontally. But what about distorting it? I really need it to kind of bend, if you will. So what I'll do is I'm going to hold down on the PC, it would be the control key. On a Mac, that's going to be the command key. And I'm going to mouse over this top right-hand corner handle. And if I start to drag it now, instead of scaling, look at what it's doing. I'm going to drag that straight up. So look, it's like it's twisting it in space. It's putting it in perspective. So all I have to do is just kind of match up the screen as best I can. So I'm just going to continue to drag these little handles, like so. Okay, now that's looking pretty good. I'll tell this OK. And now it almost appears as, that, as though that is part of this image. Well, except for the part where it's leaking out over the hand here. So how do we fix that? Now this image that we just brought in, screenshot, is on a layer by itself. So if I poke the little eyeball for that layer, it disappears. There's the original image. I can bring it back. OK. So, because it's on a separate layer, it's going to make it really easy for me to mask this particular area. Now you can erase it. If I erase it, that's going to be a destructive process. You say, well, William, it's not going to matter. We, we want to remove that permanently anyway. And you certainly can do that. But for me, I tend to err on the side of, uh, of being safe, and I always use a mask. So once again, I'm just going to come over here to the Layers panel, and I'm going to use a layer mask. It puts an empty layer mask on, and then I just zoom in here. So I grab my zoom tool, I zoom in a little closer. But how do I know where these fingers actually fall? So if I start masking, okay, I use the paintbrush, and I paint with black, and I start masking, Okay, how do I know when I've gone, oops, too far, or not far enough? Well, that's the beauty of using a mask rather than an eraser tool. If this were an eraser tool, well, I'd have to go edit, undo, and then try it again. But with a mask, I don't have to do that. If I come in here and I start masking away, and I go, oops, I went too far, well, I can selectively undo this. Because it's a mask and I'm painting with black, I'm hiding that mask. If I come over here and I paint with white, so I switch my foreground color, I'm going to make the brush a little bit smaller so I can get into these detail areas. I can come back in and start bringing back that screenshot. 
So I'm compositing these two images together and I'm masking it out to make it fit my environment. Pretty darn cool. Now, the image that I brought over is really bright, and it really probably doesn't fit my environment uh, maybe as well as I'd want. So I could maybe apply an adjustment to that layer. So maybe we do something like, once again, perhaps the um, levels adjustment here. So on the levels adjustment, I'm just going to take the brightness down a little bit. Um, if I take the, uh, the uh, midpoint slider here and I pull it a little to the right, it kind of darkens it down a little bit. It's not too bad. But notice what's happening here. I'm going to, I'm going to turn this off for a moment. Okay. So there's before. Here's after. Let me, let me do it a little more extreme here. How about this? There's before. There's after. What's happening? This adjustment is happening everywhere. It's happening not just on my screenshot, but on the background, the original image as well. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to leave it really, really dark for right now, just so you can see the impact of this. So that means I have to mask this, right? Well, typically I would say yes. I want to mask this adjustment to this layer, okay? So instead of actually masking it, I'm gonna create another type of mask and I'm actually gonna let Photoshop do this. So instead of me taking the time to paint this mask, very carefully paint this in, or perhaps even repurposing the mask I've already created, I'm gonna create what we call a clipping mask. Now a clipping mask uses the layer itself as a mask. So in this particular scenario, I have a screenshot. It has the corner of it shaved off. It has been distorted. It's been twisted in space here. So everything outside of that screenshot is just transparent. There's nothing there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that twisted, semi-hidden, partially masked image and use it as a mask for this new uh, adjustment layer. Let's check it out. So this one is so simple and it only works in these types of scenarios. So I want this adjustment to only affect this layer immediately below it. What I will do is I can either do this right here inside of the um, properties panel. So I'm gonna open up my properties panel again. I did that by just double clicking on this uh, little icon for the adjustment layer. And right here at the bottom of the properties panel, there's this little icon. It has a square with a little arrow coming out from the side of it. If I click on that, that converts this into a clipping mask. So now this adjustment is only affecting the layer immediately below it. Everything else is left the way it was. So now I'm free to go ahead and adjust this the way I see fit. So now I can pull this a uh, little mid slider back till I feel like that fits the image. I can also do this with other things if I wanted to go in and maybe throw a little color balance on it and maybe introduce a little bit of color to this. Okay, so I'm just going to throw the colors off here a little bit to make it fit my scene a little better here. But that's affecting everything. So once again, with this adjustment that I'm applying, I'm going to choose this option here. Only apply it to the screen. Very, very cool. So that is just one method of compositing images. There's so many different ways that you can go about doing this, and it really depends on your specific needs. So I'll encourage you to take a look at my title here at Brightstream TV of compositing images with Photoshop. All right, well, um, that's the, uh, the last bit of this particular image. So what I want to do is I want to uh, just take a moment and let you uh, ask any questions, make any comments, 
and um, I'm going to try to address those here. Now, I did see a question about the masks, so I'm hoping that what we've done here has addressed those issues of creating these masks. So you can create them on your own, or like I just did here, you can use one of the existing layers as a clipping mask. Okay, let's dive back in here, and I want to take a look at some of the questions that we have. Now, if for some reason we, we, you don't have a question here, maybe, maybe uh, it's just not popping into your head right now, uh, that's okay. Uh, feel free to shoot us an email uh, after the fact, training at Brightstream TV, and we can address those questions. But go ahead, if you've got a question, pop that in there. Uh, I'm going to keep on with this, and uh, I'm going to take a look at perhaps another image here and just maybe go through some of the basics here. Okay, so I'm going to come over here to a, a Springhouse photo here. Okay, so this is another image. It's taken directly off the camera. It's a JPEG. So let's review this process here. We open an image. The first thing we want to do is, well, let's check the resolution. We go up to the image menu, choose image size, and then review. So this image is extremely high resolution. So uh, let's take it over here to inches. So I've got a, about a 16 and a half by almost 11 inch image at a resolution of 300 pixels per inch. That's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good size image there. So that's good enough for what I intend to do. Now, even if I intend to use this at a lower resolution, I don't change it here. Just leave it alone. So I cancel it. Next, I take a look at maybe saving this as a duplicate. I never want to work on this original. Plus, remember, this is a JPEG. So if I make a change and save it, not only is it destructive, but it's also going to rewrite that JPEG and actually degrade the photo a little. Okay, so let's do a save as. I'm going to go up to the file menu. I'm going to choose Save As. For the file type, I'm going to switch it to Photoshop. Okay. I can change the name, but I'll leave the name the same. Now, the really nice thing about this is because it has a different file extension, both Windows and the Mac operating system will understand that this is a different file, even though they have the same name. Now, if you want, you can certainly edit the name. So I might call this my Springhouse master file. So this is my master image that I would work from. So I just simply append master to the name. I'll click Save, and there we have it. Now when I do a Save As command like that, Photoshop leaves me with this new image. It, does, it closes the old image and leaves me with this new duplicate image. Okay. So next, we want to address the overall light and dark and perhaps the color cast that's in here. So once again, I'm going to use my adjustments panel for this. Now, one of the other adjustments that you can use perhaps for this is the uh, exposure adjustment. Oops, I accidentally bumped it twice, so I got two of them, so I'll remove one. Now, the exposure adjustment, uh, it only has three sliders here. Uh, it's a little different. Um, it just goes about the process of making these adjustments, a little bit different than the levels adjustment. So with this, I can change the overall exposure. So if I grab that and pull it to the right, you see the image is getting brighter and brighter everywhere. If I pull it to the left, it gets darker and darker and darker. So the exposure here is kind of like the um, exposure setting in the camera and you generally don't have to move this too far. But let's say I want to brighten the image up a little bit. I'll pull the exposure to the right ever so slightly, brighten it up. Now I also have this feature called the offset and then the gamma correction. Now the gamma is kind of the mid-tones here. So for me, adjusting the exposure, you know, I got the brighter tones here, but uh, maybe it's washed out a little much. I can take the gamma correction here, and if I drag it uh, to the left, it's just going to keep 
getting brighter and brighter and brighter, but it's not affecting the highlights so much, not affecting the shadows. It's really affecting those midtones. So this is a lot like the uh, little uh, midtone slider that we found in the levels adjustment. If I drag it back to the right, it's going to pull those areas down a little bit. Okay. So now the image has got a little more Christmas to, uh, crispness to it. <laughs> I'll get that out in a moment. Uh, it's a little bit sharper here. So if I, if I turn this off, you can see there's the before, kind of kind of dark, kind of dull. But now, with just these two sliders here, I've made it you know, a little more pop to it. Okay. I'm going to pull that exposure down just a touch because I want to keep some of the detail here in the sign. Okay, so that's a really nice quick adjustment, the exposure adjustment. Now, I really don't notice too much of a uh, color tone in here. There's a little bit maybe here in the background of the sun hitting the, uh, the white uh, of the house here. But, um, you know, I can, I can adjust that as well. And I can go in and once again maybe use that levels adjustment to do this. So I can put a levels adjustment right on top of another adjustment. So two tonal adjustments here. Uh, in this case, because I have that white, I can grab the white eyedropper here and I can click on the white in that area and it will make a very subtle adjustment. Now if I click on an area that's not truly white, let's say the caps here on the sign, you see they have a little pinkish color to them? You see it throws the whole image off. The image went way green for that. Well, how do you undo an adjustment like that? Every one of these adjustments at the bottom of the properties panel has this uh, reset button here. It's a little arrow that's kind of spinning back to the left. So I just click on that. All right. So now I, like I said, make an adjustment here, maybe click on the white area that I want to adjust, and there we go. Any color adjustment uh, that I want to make from this point, I can just continue to add to this process. So the tonal value looks pretty good. Color looks pretty good too. Um, what about maybe a localized adjustment? Okay. So let's say maybe I wanted to brighten up some of this here in the background. Maybe I want to bring some of that forward here by brightening it up. Well, once again, I might would want to make a selection first. So there's different types of selections. Like I said, my go-to tool here is the lasso tool. Uh, this time I'm going to use the polygonal lasso tool. This tool works not so much like a pencil or a pen where I have to click and drag with it. It works more like a connect to dots type of scenario where I just click along the edge and uh, Photoshop will connect the two points that I click with the selection. So if I just want to affect this background area here, I can start in the corner, click, and then I'm not holding the mouse button down or anything. It's just, you see it's stretching this little wire out. So I can come out here and I can stretch this out. And I'm just going to kind of go down the side of the house here, come back up across the sign. But see, I can avoid the sign here. And even though that sign has a curved top, I just click ever so um, closely together here, just make more little reference points here, and I can just trace around those edges. Nice. All right. And I come back up here to the top and I finish my selection. So I've just kind of selected that one little area there. I'll go ahead and apply an adjustment. Just so we get a, a, a wider range or assortment of adjustments here, I'm going to use this one. It's called a curves adjustment. Okay. Curves adjustment, once again, makes a, um, a tonal change in your image. Now, I like this because it has a special little feature inside of it. So you get this, this little diagonal line here. It's like, well, what does this do? And, and why is this thing called curves? Well, you can bend that line. So depending on how I bend the line, I can either put the house in shadows here or I can bring them into the sunlight like so. But it's, it's kind of odd, you know, and it, it builds this kind of curvy shape. Okay. 
So what if I'm not sure where to bend the line to get the results I'm after? Well, I'm going to reset this using the little reset tool. And at the top left corner of this particular adjustment, there's a little hand that has little arrows coming out of the finger. Now this is a, a targeted adjustment. And this thing is really, really cool. I select it, and then I mouse out here in my photograph, and I say, well, um, this area may be back here on the back side of the house, okay? Or maybe up here at the top. I want to brighten that area up. So I simply mouse over it, click and hold. If I drag down, it makes it darker. If I drag up, it makes it lighter. And what it's trying to do is affect more of this area than any of the other area that I have selected. So it's putting a little arc in this curve here in the properties panel. Now I can keep going with this. Let's say that uh, I decide that some of the highlights here on the leaves, they're getting too bright. If I click and hold and I can drag those down, you see it'll tone those back down. Okay? So it's really, really neat. It allows you to selectively target between lighter areas and darker areas and make those areas lighter or darker. We use this a lot to increase contrast in images, but that is the curves tool. All right, so a little curves adjustment here. It is only applying in this one area, so if I turn this on and off, you can see it's only affecting the front half of the house. It's not affecting the side or the sign. Very cool. Targeted adjustment. All right, so uh, if I had any other color adjustments, I would certainly do those. I really don't have any here. Any blemishes? Okay, so we definitely have some blemishes on this one. What about these power lines and this light and all this junk back here in the back? It's not very attractive. I also have a power line over here in the upper right-hand corner. Not very attractive. So let's go in and take care of those. I'm going to take out this uh, power line up here at the top. So I'm just going to zoom into that area. I want to uh, add a new adjustment layer above the photograph. Okay, so down here in the layers panel, I target that background layer and uh, just by clicking on it. And then I click the new layer icon at the bottom of the layers panel. It creates a new empty layer. Okay. We've seen the um, spot healing brush, and that, that does work really well in a lot of areas, but just some of the other tools that you have, okay? There is a standard healing brush, which is right beside mine because I've changed the tools. But if I grab that healing brush, with this tool, you don't just paint over the problem area. First, you have to sample an area. You have to copy an area. So I would copy some of these uh, bluish white pixels here in the sky and then paint them over this, okay? To do that, all I have to do is I've got the tool selected, I hold down my Alt or Option key on a Mac and click in the what I call good pixel area. These are the pixels I want to duplicate. Click once, I release that Alt or Option key and then I can start painting, but one other issue I'm going to run into, when I start painting this, nothing happens. I'm trying to paint that out, but nothing's happening. Remember, I'm using a non-destructive method, so I have created a new empty layer. This tool is sampling those empty pixels. So once again, up here at the top in the tool options bar, the sample option here, a little different on this tool, but it's the same concept. Instead of the current layer, I want current and below. Now I can sample. I hold down the Alt key, click to sample, release. And now when I paint, oh, now we're starting to see that the power line disappears. Pretty cool. So that tool works really well. It does have a blending mode and that blend is the, the whole idea behind the healing. It is 
um, strategically copying and pasting those pixels that I sampled as I paint. And then when I release the, the brush there, it tries to blend the edges of those copied pixels into the surrounding to make a nice seamless finish. So that tool is really great for that type of thing, uh, but there are other tools out there. Now my favorite is the clone stamp tool. And what this allows me to do is basically the same thing, but it doesn't include the healing portion of it. So it's not for everyone, but it is a really remarkable tool. And we use it in the same non-destructive method. We create a new empty layer. We turn on the tool option to sample this layer and below, so current layer and below. We make the sample, we make the repair. And we're doing all of this on that extra empty layer. That way, if we ever need to come back and either take more out or bring back some of that power line or whatever it is that we removed, we can. It's totally non-destructive. All right, so I'm gonna just polish this up a little bit more and then we'll wrap it up. So the other tool I was mentioning here is the clone stamp tool. Now it looks like a little rubber stamp. So I'm gonna select that. And once again, I am going to hold down my Alt or Option key to set a sample point. So I set a sample point, release the Alt or Option key, and then I start painting over the blemish area. So just removing the little power line here. Works great. And we don't really see much of a difference from the, um, from the healing brush tool, okay? Here's the difference. When I get over here to the power pole, and I'm going to touch the top edge of the house here. The healing brush has a tendency to blur this edge a little too much. The clone stamp tool, however, does not. So I'm going to make another sample. I'm going to hold down the Alt key. I'm going to sample here close to the power pole. And I'm going to mouse over this area, and I'm going to just kind of trace along that edge. Okay, I'm going to sample again. And now I can get right up next to the house, they're right up next to those shingles, and I get a nice crisp edge there. If I did this with the other tool, if I try this with the uh, uh, healing brush, I'll do it here on, oh, let's say the bottom side of the house, or maybe right here. Uh, I sample, and I start painting. As long as I'm out here, no problem. But, oops, if I try to do this too close to the house, I could possibly end up with some blurred pixels here, and I can barely see a little bit of it coming out there. I'll try it here at the bottom as well. So once again, sample, and then I paint along this bottom edge here. And you, know, you can see there's a little bit of the color from the house kind of leaking out here into the bottom. That is that healing process. So it is blending some of the pixels from the house, some of these yellow pixels, down into the sky here. So like I said, this is really a job for the clone stamp tool because it doesn't suffer from that uh, particular feature. So if I paint along this edge, I get a nice crisp edge, and there you go. Now, one of the other things you'll note is as I keep going, oh, what's happening here? It's redrawing this uh, pole. That's because of where I sampled. So I just simply resample. Okay. So that's the only kind of gotcha with this tool is you have to just watch where you're sampling because it is an interactive copy and paste. But now I can erase that and I can pull out that power pole. So just very quickly, I'm going to knock this power pole out for us. Just erase it away. Now I'm still using that uh, clone stamp tool. So when I get to the edge of this roof line, you see I'm not getting any of that blurriness there. I'm not getting any of that healing effect. I'm simply trimming it off to fit. Look at that. So there we go, one less uh, power pole there and power line. I would do the same back here in the background here to remove those unwanted artifacts. So now there you have it, another review here of just that particular process. We go through, we open the image, we double check the resolution of the image uh, to fit what we need, make sure it's gonna 
be the right size. We save a duplicate image and we work on that duplicate file. Now that duplicate file does need to be a Photoshop file. That way we don't run into any issues of resampling every time we save, like what we would get with a JPEG. So just keep that in mind. Save your files as Photoshop files. Remember, at the end, when you've finished making your adjustments, you can always export these files as other file types. So your JPEGs, your PNGs, your GIFs, your TIFFs, your EPSs, you name it, you got it. So work in Photoshop files as Photoshop files and then save them out as the file type that you need. Work this process like, you, like I did here. Not every um, particular bullet point that I hit is going to be needed for every photograph. So you may be able to work in your global adjustments of tonal and color properties and then never really have to make too many localized adjustments. Maybe you don't need to make any tonal adjustments. Maybe the image that you get is perfectly balanced for color and light, and you just need to tweak a small color in a small area. And that's fine. But this workflow is a good starting point for anyone and everyone, no matter how it is you're going to use the photograph. Well, that's it for this particular episode. Be sure to tune in as we uh, dive deeper into Photoshop and pick out uh, specific topics and specific areas of this magnificent tool. Well, that's going to wrap it for this time. I'm William Everhart. I want to thank you once again for joining us here at Brightstream TV. Check back with us every Friday here at the same time for some free online training. Thanks, folks.